Hello everyone. So this is Sandeep Sharma here. The AIMS exam is already done. And uh, in this video, we shall be discussing the AIMS pattern pediatric questions. Any exact resemblance to any question is coincidental. However, if you have given the paper, you would relate with the topics we are discussing. If you talk about the overall general pattern of the paper, it was a typical AIMS paper. It was more like a neat exam. There were less visuals, no videos, no atypical questions and many one-liners, many repeats from the last 10 years of AIMS were asked. So, uh, does not matter if your concepts were good, you must have done well. Talking about pediatrics, there were around 11 to 12 questions. Out of them, around 80% of them were easy and solvable, directly taken from the notes. So, let us begin the discussion. First of all, the first question, vitamin deficiency causing neonatal seizures is... If you look at your class notes, wherever I have taken the class, you would find that it is a one-liner mentioned in neonatal seizures. The most common vitamin deficiency causing neonatal seizures is vitamin B6, that is pyridoxin. Why pyridoxin? We know that there is a, a neurotransmitter known as glutamic acid or glutamate. Glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter. This is converted by an enzyme known as glutamic acid decarboxylase or GAD into GABA. GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. So, glutamate is excitatory neurotransmitter and GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. Now, during this reaction, the rate limiting step is glutamic acid decarboxylase. This is the enzyme which is formulating. GAD requires B6 that is pyridoxin as the coenzyme. Now, imagine what will happen. If there is B6 deficiency, this step will not happen. If this step will not happen, there will be relative excess of excitatory neurotransmitter that is glutamate acid and deficiency of inhibitory neurotransmitter that is GABA and this will manifest in the form of neonatal seizures. So you can remember it as a one-liner but since it has been asked, so the next time they repeat they may ask you the details. The detail is it inhibits the uh, absence of B6 leads to inhibition or decreased in the formation of GABA and this leads to neonatal seizures. So the first question answer is D that is pyridoxin deficiency. Moving to question number two. All of the following are true uh, for WHO grading of severe acute malnutrition except it has been asked multiple number of times in the past that weight for height less than minus three standard deviation is a criteria. So this is also called as severe wasting. Presence of symmetrical edema is one of the criteria. So that is also one of the criteria which is there. And mid upper arm circumference less than 11.5 is one of the criteria. Less than 11 centimeter will always, 11 centimeter is the same as this is 110 millimeters is same as 11 centimeter. So MUAC kisi bachche if it is less than 11 centimeter that would certainly be severe acute malnutrition. What is the odd one out here? The odd one out is weight for age less than minus 3 standard deviation. Weight for age as a standalone criteria is not used to define severe acute malnutrition. Weight for age hum lete hain percentage ka older system mein and that also with symmetrical edema alone weight for age or height for age are not a criteria for severe acute malnutrition. This is a repeat question has been asked in AIMS, PGI, JIPMER, NEET, all four exams in the past. So it is a repeat question. Getting such a question wrong is uh, criminal in AIMS exam. So question number two, the answer is B. The odd one out is B. Question number now, very tricky, very difficult question and uh, many of you have got it wrong. Six month old child is able to transfer or shift objects from hand to hand. What development factor does this indicate? This is taken from a table given in Nelson 21st edition. What is the table? Let us look at the table. This is the table. I have taken as a snapshot from Nelson 21st edition. This is the table given in Nelson 21st edition and just look at it. This question is asking about able to transfer objects hand to hand. So transfers object hand to hand is given here. It comes average age of attainment 5.5 or 6 months. Or ye kya implicate karta hai? It implicates comparison of objects. So transferring of object from hand to hand lets a child develop the ability to compare the objects. It is not a feature suggesting development of visual motor coordination. Visual motor coordination four months pe aajata hai aur uska 
milestone relevant milestone is reaching out for objects so by dexterous grasp unidextrous grasp those are the things and the child is able to hold them that is visio motor coordination transferring object hand to hand is a feature which suggests development of brain synapses which allow the child to comprehend comparison of different objects so question number 3 the answer is c comparison of different objects it is given in nelson text it is given in nelson pre test nelson ka pre test ka ye indirect question hai and it is given in the nelson table also so the answer to question number 3 is c comparison of different objects i'm sorry many of you have got it wrong it's okay difficult question hai majority of students would have got it wrong so this type uh, type of questions even pg students get them wrong in the paper question number 4 on repair of vsd the patient will show improvement in which of the following vsd uh, in a patient who has symptomatic vsd failure to thrive is a common complication due to ongoing ccf and when you, the patient's vsd is successfully managed failure to thrive rapidly shows improvement this is also given in nelson 21st edition nelson 21st edition ka ye line hai i have taken as a snapshot it says most in fact this is Uh, what nelson says after surgery of vsd most infants begin to thrive often quite rapidly after hospital discharge and cardiac medications are no longer required catch up growth occurs in most patients within the next year so the most important thing which improves after successful vsd surgery is failure to thrive ab heart block and arrhythmias are the complications of vsd surgery they can be seen in post operative complications so they are not uh, the answer and respiratory alkalosis pre vsd and post vsd respiratory alkalosis the improvement is not significant as it has been shown in many multiple trials so question number 4 the obvious answer is a failure to thrive nelson gai do not even talk about the respiratory alkalosis thing question number 4 the answer is a question number 5 which of the following does not suggest asthma in a child now asthma in a child is a tricky thing uh, options are were overlapping and uh, as far as uh, i know many of the options have not properly been recalled by most of the students what you need to know i will be mentioning here if you have given the exam you can correlate what was actually given in the paper so what you need to know how do we diagnose asthma in a child now nelson says that the following things are there which help in diagnosis first of all when you do spirometry in asthma in a child the fev1 over fvc ratio is less than 0.8 that is it is less than 80% of expected secondly we look for reversibility of the obstruction how do we check for reversibility we check for peak expiratory flow rate or fev1 value before and after giving a bronchodilator like saba short acting beta agonist to aapne pehle fev1 kiya then you gave a puff of saba that is short acting beta agonist and you do, do it immediately after that what you will find is that post short acting beta agonist inhalation if the fev1 rises more than 12% then it is a criteria it is a indicator of bronchial asthma in the child so the value of fev1 is more than 12% in a child child and adult values vary in spirometric definitions remember that number 3 you will check for exercise challenge exercise challenge test when you do exercise before exercise you take pefr or fev1 value and after that you take pre and post you find that fev1 if it worsens by equal to or more than 15% then again it is a feature of asthma now the latest gina 2020 guidelines have changed this criteria a bit they say that the new guidelines i'm writing in color these are the gina guidelines modification which have happened they say that fev1 should worsen by equal to or by more than 12% and peak expiratory flow rate should worsen by more than equal to or more than 15% this is the gina modification which have happened in the latest guidelines fourth criteria is diurnal variation also known as am to pm variation if the diurnal morning mein aur evening mein aap check kare 
look at the peak expiratory flow rate or FEV1. If the FEV1 value morning and evening variation is equal to or more than 20 percent, in bracket I am writing AM to PM, then it is also suggestive of asthma in the child. And fifth, the point which was not there in the options but still you need to know that there is a new criteria known as exhaled nitric oxide fragment. We also call it as fraction of exhaled nitric oxide, phenol. If exhaled and NO value is more than 20 units, that is also taken to be asthma. So any one or more of these values are diagnostic of bronchial asthma in a child. It was a difficult question. Uh, the options which you have given, uh, which I have got, I did not give the paper, but I have seen that almost seven to eight different modifications of options were given. So rather than creating a, uh, uh, any controversy, I have given you what you need to know, see what was given in the paper and what did you mark. For the future exams like uh, upcoming PGI and JIPMER, please remember these pyrometric values. They are important for your upcoming exams as well. Moving on to question number six. A child presents with high grade fever, inspiratory strider, develops swallowing difficulty with drooling of saliva within four to six hours. So rapidly progressive child with strider and fever. I have discussed this in my class. I am putting a snapshot of what I teach in my class. This is what, this is my handwriting. This is the figure which I show. This I have taken from one of the notes which I made while teaching in the class. This is a child with acute epiglottitis. Why do I say acute epiglottitis? The child has fever, the child has strider, child has drooling of saliva and sometimes child breathes in tripod position. There is rapid progression to complete obstruction as it is happening in this child. The obstruction rapidly involves the whole pharynx. First step in management is always airway or airway management karne ke baad, what next needs to be given? You need to start IV fluids and you need to give IV third generation cephalosporins because it is a fulminant bacterial pneumococcal infection. And what is the option here? The question number six, the answer is D, IV septraxone. So if you had read your notes well, this was already discussed in the class. Not only my class, even if you have attended any pediatric teaching or any coaching and you are thorough with your notes, this is mentioned there. Things are there from the notes only, but it just does not occur to some of us in the exam. So answer to this question is D, IV septraxone because diagnosis is epiglottitis. This is not crude as many of you were thinking. Question number seven, diphtheria vaccine is which type of vaccine? Diphtheria vaccine, easy one. It is a toxoid type of vaccine. Toxoid vaccines include diphtheria, uh, pertussis, tetanus, influenza subunit and even anthrax vaccine. The list is taught to you in PSM as well as in pediatrics class. So diphtheria vaccine is a toxoid. It is an easy one. Minimum levels of tetanus antitoxin blood levels which are protective. Direct line taken from OPGAI. OPGAI says antitoxin level of 0 0.01 international units per ml is considered protective. So answer to this question is B, 0 0.01 international unit per ml. Question number nine, in phototherapy, bilirubin is converted to what? In phototherapy, the bilirubin, when you give phototherapy, in phototherapy, we use blue-green light. When you use blue-green light, this has been discussed in the class if you check your notes, 460 to 490 nanometers wavelength of light is used. This freely crosses the skin, reaches blood and starts converting the circulating unconjugated bilirubin directly into polar compounds. The most important mechanism is structural isomerization. In structural isomerization, there is a, a substance known as lumirubin which is formed. This lumirubin is water soluble. It is excreted from the body. So without involving liver, phototherapy by forming lumirubin and other stereoisomers helps in removal of unconjugated bilirubin from the body. This lumirubin, now the question has come, so additional extra edge point you can write. Kaise banta hai? This forms when light falls on this of this wavelength, then there is intramolecular cyclization. Intramolecular cyclization, which is why polar compounds get uh, uh, projected to the outwards of that ring and that becomes that molecule becomes water soluble so which structural isomerization is involved intramolecular cyclization which converts unconjugated bilirubin into lumirubin so answer to this question is a lumirubin question number 10 
number 10. History of fever with bloody diarrhea two weeks back in a three year old child followed by swollen red erythematous joints. So there is arthritis happening two weeks after a bloody diarrhea. What is the most likely cause? This is typical uh, reactive arthritis. Most common cause of reactive arthritis in children is Shigella flexneri. And so the answer to this question is B, that is Shigella. What is the management? You, you, of course, the uh, virus has, the, the bacteria has come, caused infection and has gone away. So if there are evidence, you can give antibiotics. Otherwise, management of arthritis primarily involves rest, use of non-steroid and anti-inflammatory drugs and aspirin. Many severe cases, you may need to give a short dose of corticosteroid because it is a immune mediated reaction. So answer to this question, what is the diagnosis? Reactive arthritis, most common cause, Shigella. And lastly, question number 11, not useful in the management of Gullian barre syndrome. This is what Harrison says. This is written in Nelson also, but Harrison is more emphatic. Harrison says that glucose corticoids, that is steroids, have not been found to be effective. So what is not useful? Steroids are not useful in the management. Plasma aphoresis, IVIG is the therapy of choice. Plasma aphoresis is given where IVIG fails or in, in severe cases. And if the uh, illness projects, if there is ascending infection involves respiratory muscles, you need to give ventilatory support to save the life of the child. So question number 11, the answer is C. So these are the pediatric questions, except for the asthma question and development milestone question. The remaining questions are easy. 9 out of 11 should have been solved if you were thorough with your class notes. So this is regarding the pediatrics part. All the best for your upcoming exams and any doubts you are most welcome to discuss. Thank you very much. This is Sandeep Sharma signing off. Bye-bye.